Hello everyone, my name is Jordan Hart. I am the online editor of Labels and Labeling Magazine, and today I'm sitting down with Claudia to discuss what makes meaningful work. So Claudia, if you'd like to introduce yourself and give us a little taste of what you do for work. Sure, so I'm the president of Affinity HR Group and we're an HR consulting firm. We're national, um, and so we work with small to medium-sized businesses internationally, but mostly within the United States uh, to help them with their hiring or their people management challenges, uh, employee engagement, things like that. So uh, a lot of remote work, a lot of our clients are not near us. And so we have a, we've been working remotely um, for 10 years. So th this is something that we're quite used to and, and are familiar with in terms of the current work environment. but. Uh, we've been working with a lot of clients to see their own struggles and, and trying to change their workplace as a result of what we're dealing with with 2020. Yeah, and we will get into workplaces as a whole later, but given what you do, I thought you'd be a great person to shed a little insight on what do you think makes work meaningful? Great. Well, I'm delighted to be here. Thank you for asking me. So. Do you think that the meaningfulness of work is intrinsic or is it something that people add to it? I think it's a combination. And I think um, it is so personalized also that if there was a one size fits all, if you could push a button or do one thing or create one change, we would all be doing it. Um, so, so I think meaning comes from uh, both the intrinsic, how the workplace and the work that you do satisfies your own internal motivators and drivers, the things that are important to you personally from a value perspective, um, and also your ability to operate within your own natural and comfortable behavioral style. So if you're an introvert, you have the time and space to do what you need to do. If you're an extrovert, you're with friends and people, and so the inter personal piece is more important. So uh, it definitely is a combination um, of all of those things. What we also see is that if something is lacking or if there is something that does not exist in the workplace that's important to us, that can also turn the workplace into a demotivator. So um, work can be meaningful, but work can also be deleterious to make us feel worse off as a result of the experience of being and working in that space. From the research that I've done, it definitely seems like it is much easier to take away meaning from work than to find meaning in it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I, and I think that's a very common, I think that's a very common experience because I think finding meaning at work, um, it, if you have some things, for example, you may be doing something that's incredibly meaningful and satisfying your own personal goals, personal motivators, but if you're not paid well, or if your boss is a complete jerk, or if your hours are so long that they take you away from your family and the things that are otherwise important to you, then the work that you do isn't sufficient to overcompensate for those things that, that are taking away from the meaning of your work. So it, it also, it's not just the work in the workplace, it's also how it fits into your overall life and, and what that looks like. Yeah, and one idea I stumbled across that I wanted you to weigh in on is the idea that work becomes meaningful in the retrospective. Do mm -hmm. you think that's true? And if so, I guess, what can people do to in the present moment, look around and find that meaning? So I, I think that oftentimes everything becomes more meaningful in the retrospective. You know, we oftentimes look back on our experiences with um, a sense of um, nostalgia and a sense of, um, oh, that that was such a simpler time. You know, I think back on high school and think, ah, oh, that was such a simpler time. But, you know, when I was in high school, it was horrible. And, <laughs> you know, and I had different pressures and different issues. So I often ask people to kind of give up that retrospective look because it, it's it's filtered through it's notoriously filtered through a sentimentality that may or may not have existed in the moment um but i think it i think one of the things that we've learned during this current pandemic is the importance of gratitude and appreciating where we are today and we oftentimes don't take the time to do that we're always i think as a definitely as a culture in the United States, if not as a piece of our sort of our DNA as human beings, 
we tend to want to look for what's next. We tend to be thinking, where am I going and how am I going to get there? And when are my children going to be a little bit older? Or when am I going to have children? Or when is this relationship going to evolve? And we don't take the moment in our life and in our work to stop and say, this is good. You know, this is okay. And I, I'm happy with where I am. And one thing, um, you know, I've, I've done a lot of presentations in the last year about um, emotional intelligence, dealing with stress, resiliency, change management, all of the things that we've all really been struggling with. And I always end with um, with what I, what's called the Reiki prayer. And a Reiki is a healing modality. And the prayer is something that all Reiki practitioners know. Um, and it's just been so helpful to me. And I think also to many of my friends and colleagues, which is just for today, I will not be angry. Just for today, I will not be afraid. Just for today, I will be grateful for my blessings. Just for today, I will work honestly. And just for today, I will be kind to every living thing, in, including myself. And it's that gratitude just for today. I, I can't promise I'm going to be that way tomorrow. But if I can be that way today, then it will make today better. And the more todays you get under your belt, with that perspective, the more I do think it focuses you back on meaning and meaningfulness and appreciation for the moment. Yeah, and I think meaningfulness will change given uh, the state of life you're in. Like for the pandemic we're in and the economic kind of downturn we've seen, your meaningfulness in your job might be that you have food on the table for your family that week. Whereas maybe previously it was, oh, this is my passion and I get to do that. I think yes. that that's a sliding scale throughout life. Absolutely. And, and you know, we look at things like I, I've now had time to spend with my children in a way that maybe I would rather have spent a little less time with my children, <laughs> but, but, but I'm so grateful for it. And you also, I think many of us look at that and, and count our blessings and feel almost guilty for our blessings because so many, so many have lost loved ones. So many have have chairs at the table that are no longer occupied by people that they love. And and so there's also this sense of like, I shouldn't complain or I shouldn't celebrate because others are suffering so greatly. And I think I think that's okay. I think we can be grateful for what we have because we recognize that others don't have that and 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 put that in its context. Yeah. Now when things get a bit more hopeful and people can kind of move out of this economic crisis and start having a bit of hope again, what role do you think passion has in finding meaning in work? Oh, that's such a great question. Um, I, I think that you have to really be passionate about something that you do. And I do not think that you need necessarily to satisfy all of that passion at your work. And, and a lot of folks, and, and this was sort of a millennial thing. Everybody talked about millennials in the last 10 years about they, they really want to do what matters to them in their job. You know, and there's that saying, if you do what you love um, every day, you'll never work a day in your life. Right. But that's true to a point, I think. But as long as your work can provide you with the opportunity to find passion in your life, that really is the whole. And, and I think it's, it's a little hard to find real passion um, in work. Some people do, and that's wonderful. I love to be around people, and I have that opportunity most of the time and not the last year. But that's what I'm passionate about. Am I passionate about human resources and employee handbooks and disciplinary actions? No. But do I? am I passionate about connecting with people and helping them to work through their challenges? Yes, that's what I'm passionate about. So I think it's finding the elements in your work that satisfy those motivators. And those motivators are going to be different. Some people are motivated by learning new things. Some people are motivated by money. Some people are motivated by helping others or being in a position of power and status or being in an, a work environment where you share values and you're, and you're working toward a, a common goal. There are lots of different workplace motivators. You just need to know which one is yours and try to, to, to maximize those opportunities where you can. 
Yeah, it's very much a do you have the room to find that more so than trying to shove yourself into like a square peg in a round hole. Absolutely. And and but but it's also, you know, sort of teasing out what elements are uh, that you love to do and and do more of them. Um, I was having a conversation yesterday with a woman who's going through a career transition, and I, I encouraged her to do an exercise that I think we should all do, which is, what do you do during your day? Like, what are your tasks? And what do you love out of those tasks? And what are you great at? And what do you hate out of those tasks? And what are you bad at? And And we should all be trying to focus on doing what we love and what we're good at, and what we're lo we love and maybe are bad at, because those give us the opportunities to grow. It's like our own internal SWOT analysis and really trying not to do the stuff that we hate and we're bad at, because that's not helping anyone. It's not helping our work. It's not helping our, our, our clients, our constituents, whoever it is. But finding what pa passion you have and trying to maximize that, I think, is, a, is, a, is something we should all try and do professionally. So take... Up until now, we've kind of been focusing on the employee or the personal aspect of it. Let's mm -hmm. flip that around. And as a corporate level, what makes a good workplace and what makes a company desirable to work at? And I think that that's, I'm going to guess, differ for everyone. But are there characteristics that you see in businesses like that win the awards for best workplaces? What do they all have in common, I guess, that sets them apart? The ones that are authentically wonderful, um, and I've worked with many of them, um, have at the helm leaders who are, who truly care about their employees, who are authentic in their care and their, and their consideration for their employees. And there's a Chinese proverb, which is that the fish rots from the head down. And so if you have a rotten fish head, you can put in place a lot of employee engagement, you know, you can put in that, you know, that that zip line in the rec room and, you know, allow free fruit and massages. But if they're treating you like a cog and they're working you like a dog, no, it's, it's, it's just window dressing. But if you have somebody, if you have a leader who truly cares about employees and understands that they are the most important thing, then you can feel that. And those leaders that are that way recognize that, different people have different needs, different people have different drives, different people are situated and, and are, um, are, are relied upon, their skills are celebrated differently than one another. And, they're, and they listen to their employees and they listen to what it is that drives them. Um, it's not a one size fits all. Uh, and, and, and really good leaders know that. So how do you think that can be shown to the world, like in a hiring realm? How do you put forth that to attract people into your company and show that, yes, we are authentic, we are going to care about you? Because I think everyone can claim that, but is there a way to show that authenticity? Um, I, I think testimonials are probably one of the best ways. I think showing um, in your in your practices, if you're celebrating your employees and not just your celebratory employees, but the ones that are doing everything for you from cleaning your restrooms to answering your phones to working in the mailroom up to the high high profile positions. If you see an organization that's caring for those individuals, that's celebrating their successes, that is helping them through their challenges, you know, that it's an organization that cares about its people. And, and you can oftentimes tell the difference between the window dressing and authenticity. Uh, your employees are going to be the ones that that will tell you the truth. And so if you, I would say also, if you're looking at a job, I would want to talk to some employees. I would want to talk to some clients and see what their experience is. Um, there, there's one other piece from a leadership perspective that I think is important, and that is, Oftentimes in developing their core values, business owners will sit down and say, well, we care about um, customer service and we care about being trustworthy and we care about being um, about about putting our employees first. Um, but oftentimes those are things that are put on a coffee mug or put on, you know, a, a, a mouse pad. Yeah. 
And when you walk into that space, and if you don't feel that they care about customer service, you don't feel that they are trusting environment, you don't feel that they care about their employees, those core values in themselves, having them become more aspirational than practical, and you can end up instilling a lot of resentment. So one thing that's really important that I encourage employers to do is to put together a process where everybody from the organization at different levels, you know, a sort of good sampling of your workplace, come together to, to, to discuss what are their own personal values. Because that's how you'll find out what shared values you as an organization have with all of your employees. Those are authentic. And those that organizations that view the values that their employees have as the values of the organization tend to be more authentic than those who are doing it as an Instagram campaign or, you know, or, 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 or some more uh, marketing strategy than a true articulation of what matters within the organization. Absolutely. And workplaces have changed quite drastically over this past year. I mean, there are some essential businesses that have been in person this entire time, but I think most companies have integrated some sort of virtual work from yeah. home element. Yes. I know, obviously, in your role, you've been involved with helping companies with that process. So what are some things that you've seen them do well to facilitate this transition and kind of new new way of working? Uh, the ones that are doing it well, the leaders or managers, supervisors, anybody who is in that sort of chain of command of having employees represent or report to them are checking in regularly are making sure that they're okay, are making sure that they have what they need, are, are connecting in as many ways through technology, whether it's texting, emails, letters, sending things home, video chatting, getting together to have a Zoom bingo event night, what, whatever it is to connect those employees. And again, the, the problem is there is no one size fits all. And the reality is, it's just not as good as being in person. You can't fake yeah. it. There's no one's going to do better virtually at engaging and connecting with employees than they can in person. Um, but that's not to say that people aren't really thriving and loving working from home. Yeah. And it's going to be hard to get a lot of those employees back into the office full time when they were successful at doing it at home. That's going to be an interesting challenge. But um, one of the things that we have been counseling folks on is last last year you probably had a list of things on your to-do list that involved you know satisfying your strategic goals or your budgetary goals or whatever it is now the number one goal is communicating effectively and authentically with all of your employees that comes first and it's hard and it's it's excruciating and no one has a magic bullet on it but those that are trying are probably succeeding and those that aren't trying are probably failing significantly now, it's sounding like those check-ins are not purely business related. Am I correct? Absolutely. No. And and it, it's really, it's holding open a space for folks to share what they're willing to share. And they may not share what they're willing to share, but listening and observing. And and one of the things, it's funny, I, I, I do a lot of these uh, little video things. And on our YouTube channel, the one, the one uh, video posts that I had that got more likes, that got more shares, that got more views, that got more mentions was the one where I described my own, I call it as Claudia's colossal collapse in emotional intelligence. It's the day that I went to the grocery store and they had no toilet paper and they still didn't have any flour and, and you know, the marketing thing was saying, you know, you may not be able to go out for music venues, but grab a six pack of beer and hang out in your own backyard. And I lost it. Like I totally yeah. lost it. And there was no reason for it. I mean, it wasn't a big thing, but it was, I lost it. It, it was enough small things. It was enough small things and I didn't see it coming. And I've had one or two of those since then. I think we all have where it's sort of like, it, and January has been pretty rough and February not so great because we're done. Like we just want this over with. So, so we're all having those things. So even if you're checking in with your employees informally and they're not sharing with you what they're going through, I share what I'm going through 
to create a space and an opportunity for them to know that it's okay. It's that sh being vulnerable. And um, for any of you who don't know the name Brene Brown, I you should just be say Brene Brown because she is she is the person who celebrates uh, vulnerability. And even if your employees don't want to share what they're going through, they're going through something. Nobody's not going through something. We are all going through something. And if they're not sharing with you, that's okay. As long as they know that you're going through something and you're willing to share that you're going through something. And if they need to communicate with you that they are going through something, they'll be more likely to do it than if you are a robot with a veneer that says we can get through this and a cheerleader, despite the fact that we're living through the just the worst and oddest time that anyone who's alive today has lived through. So um, I think leadership is a very long-winded answer. I'm sorry, but I think it's that leadership needs to create those personal check-ins, but also create an opportunity of vulnerability so that others would be willing to share or know that you're not invincible and that they're not alone. Yeah, and I think, strangely enough, I think that working from home has facilitated more of that vulnerability just because you're working from your home and you you can't stop that interweaving of your work life and your personal life, whether it's your coworker's dog barking in the background or a screaming kid that can't go to school because their classmate had COVID or something. It's like, mm -hmm. this is life as it is. <laughs> and here it is. I was giving an interview and all of a sudden um, I ended up having a cat fight like <laughs> up behind and over this counter, up over the windowsill, and then across the back of my desk while I was on video being interviewed. So yeah, you know, real life is happening these days. And it, it's it's a great thing. That that is a great thing to to recognize that people are real. People have lives. Um and sometimes I think we forget that and, and you can't forget it now. Yeah. It's easy when it's a it's an eight to five in a corporate office and your life can be contained in your cubicle, but it's different when someone's making a smoothie in the kitchen and you're trying to do your job. It's like, ah. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So what do you think are going to be, to end this on a positive note, what do you think are going to be some good takeaways from this very strange year we've had? I think we all are going to have a different level of appreciation for the opportunity to return to normal, whatever that looks like. I think we are all going to have a greater level of gratitude when we can get to that point. Um, we've been through a very contentious year and it's not just COVID, it's also societal unrest, political unrest. The fact that the, our institutions that we expect to be there are, are looking a little bit weaker, whether it's the postal service or whether it's, you know, our public health or our, our media communications, everything seems to have gotten a black eye. And so I think that when we're able to come together and we're able to see things from a new opportunity, it gives us the chance to say, you know, maybe some of those things weren't that important. Maybe we maybe we can look past what what separates us and start focusing on what we share. And that's something that I do a lot of coaching with businesses because oftentimes you get two different types of employees like sales and customer service or market marketing and accounting, right? These are opposite behavioral styles and oftentimes they will develop a level of resentment or dislike because they're opposites. And when you stop and say, but what do you appreciate about each other? What do you appreciate salesperson about the person who's doing the order entry for you and making sure that what you sold actually gets delivered? You can look, you can see new things that you appreciate and are grateful for. I hope that that's something that we get to deal with from an interpersonal perspective. I do think the workplace is going to be very different going forward. I do think that um, businesses are going to suffer who say, you know, everybody needs to come back into the office from eight until five, five days a week for the rest of your life. Yeah. Because if they can work from home, they've been proven that they can work from home. They have been working from home. They, they may want a little bit more flexibility. I think there will be more flexibility. And so, and those businesses that say, no, we're not going to do it, they're going to lose out because now those employees can work for a business that's in Santa Fe when they live in New Jersey, you know? So the workplace is going to be very different. 
Um, I also think we now have a window and an appreciation for parts of our society that we didn't have before. Um, I am grateful for people who come and clean my building. I am grateful for those nurses who are on the front line all of the time. I am grateful for those people who are at Lowe's, at Home Depot, at my grocery store, you know, who are putting themselves at risk in order to make sure that I have flour and toilet paper and light bulbs. So I think it's also the opportunity for us to maybe have a new appreciation for um, people who really are making this world go by and um, maybe a little more cynicism for people like the Jeff Bezos who've made a lot of money on, 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 out of the labor of people who have put themselves at risk. Um, so hopefully there'll be a little bit of a reevaluation of our priorities and, uh, and of who we celebrate in the workplace. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you so much for your time today. You have been absolutely wonderful. And it is exciting to know that there are some helpful aspects of all of this and I the think work from home are- is part of it. I, I, I think I think there are a, a new appreciation that we've all been through something. And um, the one thing I, I, uh, I, I like to leave on is a lot of folks think like we'll never get through this, you know, whether it's the politics or whether it's society or whether it's the pandemic or anything. Um, this the historian uh, Doris Kearns Goodwin, I heard her um, on the radio a couple of days, a couple of days ago, and she said, um, you know, every civilization, every every part of American society, whether it was after the Civil War or whether it was after the Great Depression, after it was World War One or the Kent State riots or when um, Dr. Martin Luther King was assassinated and when Kennedy was assassinated, we all thought this is it. Like we're coming to an end. And in every single one of those instances, we kept going and continued to prosper and thrive. And um, we've got things we need to fix, but we've always had things we need to fix and we've always worked toward them and we will continue to do that. And this is no different. So um, we'll get through it and hopefully we will be the better for it. I hope. Yeah, we are more resilient than we think we are. We are definitely more resilient than we think we are. Yes, I think we all are. Yes, exactly. Well, thank you for your time, Claudia, and we look forward to seeing more of you soon. Thank you so much. I really appreciated the opportunity to talk with you today. Good luck. Stay well. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please hit the like button and make sure to click the subscribe button at the top of the screen. You can see more videos from this playlist by clicking the video on the right or click the video on the left to see all of our other videos.